So I'd put an entire tube of Weetabix in a mixing bowl, a whole pint of milk, eat that down, and then have a couple of slices of toast with peanut butter. Hey guys, welcome to this week's video. This week I am super excited because we have an interview with a GB athlete and I am super excited to announce that that athlete is Matt Tarrant, Matthew Tarrant from the GB squad. Here's a quick bio of Matthew Tarrant. Matthew started rowing at Weybridge RC back in 2005, moving up the river to Walton RC in 2007. He earned his first GB vest competing in the 2007 Junior World Rowing Championships in the Coxless Pair. He has since represented Great Britain every year for the past 14 years through junior and under 23 up to his current position in the senior Olympic team. To date, Matthew has competed in and won medals at the National Championships, University Championships, World University Championships, Junior World Championships, Under 23 World Championships, World Cup Regattas, Youth Olympics, European Championships, Henley Royal Regatta, Senior World Championships, and formed part of the GB squad in both the Tokyo and Rio Olympics. Thank you so much for, uh, for agreeing to do this interview. Um, it's re really great to have, it's absolutely amazing to be such a small fry on YouTube, but be speaking to such a big fish in the GB pond. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll start off just with a quite a general question. So, What's it, what's it like training with GB? How, how, does it, how does it differ from just a, the sort of stuff I do as just a normal club rower? Uh, well, I guess the first obvious difference is just time commitments. Um, with the British team, you, you do train every day, all day, near enough. Um, in the old way of doing things, on the lead up to Rio, you would get a Sunday off every three weeks. Um, recently that changed sort of leading in towards Tokyo where we actually get more Sundays off than usual um, but effectively it becomes your full-time job that's what you get funded to do um, so you don't have to try and find other means of work outside to sort of look after yourself um, but that is probably the main difference is that we just we we're open to training more and more often um, so we sort of Monday through to Sunday you're on the water by 7.30 and you get home by 4, 4.30. So rowing is your full-time job, training three times a day. And uh, so what would a typical day look like for you? Uh, well, GB are quite secretive about what we do, but I guess the, the whole mantra of British rowing is, um, well, what Jürgen always used to say, miles make champions. Um, so just by that quote alone, you can get a good idea that we sort of value mileage. Uh, I guess, over intensity. Um, so a lot of the training that we do is long, boring, steady state, sort of build the aerobic base. And then throughout the week, we'll sprinkle in a few sort of, you know, like the 30 minutes at rate 20 and a couple of 2Ks here and there and we have intensities on the weekends. Um, but the, the main structure of our training is based around mileage. Yeah, but sorry, I wasn't trying to to prize <laughs> open the, the British secrets there. Um, so I imagine with all of your all of your mileage, you you must be eating a fair bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we get asked quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think. Um, oh, well, when I used to do my YouTube stuff, I actually went through an old food diary during the first lockdown to try and figure out what I used to eat in a day. I was going through a cycle where I was um, counting calories and writing down everything I was eating. And I thought, why don't I just see what I used to eat when I wasn't thinking about it? And I was still living home with my parents and I just joined the senior team. And I think those days I was easily consuming 6,000 calories a day. Um, and that was just to make it through. And I remember that that year, just being a walking corpse, just going from one session to the next, to the next, to the next, just always tired, always fatigued, um, but pushing through it and seeing the returns. 
That's a, that's a, I'm, I'm still shocked by 6,000 calories a day. I, d- I don't come anywhere near that. And I thought I trained a lot. So <laughs> that's a, no, it's, it's just surprisingly easy to get down. I, I worked out that sometimes when I get home from training, I'll be so tired. I'll jump into bed. I'll have a quick nap on maybe a Wednesday afternoon. We're just on a 30 minute. Come home, quick nap, wake up, hungry. So I'd put an entire tube of Weetabix in a mixing bowl, a whole pint of milk eat that down and then have a couple of slices of toast with peanut butter and only through counting like going through my macros and stuff I figured out that that meal alone was about 1300 calories <laughs> and that That's was an snack. incredible it recipe easy. it went down easy enough <laughs> I think I might have to try that one That's, that sounds a, uh, <laughs> that's I'm trying to get my head around a whole tube of Weetabix just yeah yeah I guess it's, it's the benefits of rowing, I guess. If you have ever been to Leander in their sort of um, canteen area for where athletes get their food, their bowls are mixing bowls and their glasses are pint glasses. So <laughs> <laughs> if you can put in the time, you deserve to be able to treat yourself and make sure you're properly fueled and hydrated. <laughs> um, so you, you touched on it uh, a bit already, but uh, a question I've, I've been telling a few people that I'm in, interviewing Matt Tarrant and one of the big questions that comes up as as just someone who spent a lot of time and a long time in GB, uh, your coach uh, for many of those years was Jurgen Grobler. Uh, what 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 was he like as a as a character around the club, as a as a person, as a coach? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was um, he was very meticulous. He was obviously very passionate. At the beginning of every year, would have a. a the team sit down in a chat um, and he'll tell us how he sees the next year planning out every year closer to the Olympics. Those meetings will get more and more hyped up and the passion will start pouring on more and more and more. Um, but I think he, he was, he was a good balance. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to know Jürgen from, I guess, both ends of the spectrum. I knew Jürgen when I was, a small fish in the team and I'd just come in and I didn't really show up on his radar at all. So I had no interaction with him at all to being one of the top guys in the team and having him as my own personal coach and seeing him every day and interacting with him every day to then <laughs> not being so much on the spectrum and then not talking to him as much. So, you know, he was, he was a very passionate guy. He was very meticulous. He was very good at what he does. Um, and I think with some people, his coaching methods were, uh, would be tough at times. I think he did have two t- two sides. He had one side that was very tough and sometimes quite hard to get along with. But then other sides, he was very comforting and sort of knew how to try and coax the best out of you. And I think some people um, would see a lot more of one side than the other. But with me, I think I was lucky because I've seen both sides of him and I think both have their own merits. Um, but he's definitely made an impact on, on the world of rowing and especially British rowing and sort of his style of coaching, I think, has sort of carried down through the generations, I, I imagine. Um, do, you, do you think that's something that's going to going to live on at, at Caversham, uh, is his style, his his impact? Uh, I, th- I think an element of it will. I think, you know, everyone has their their faults. And everyone has their strengths. And I think if, like, by talking to the athletes who have been around him the longest, you know, everyone can definitely tell you a time when he's pissed you off, but at the same time where he's really helped you out. And I think if we can draw upon the positive aspects and the things that he did really well, and then the stuff that maybe he didn't do very well, how can we make those things better moving forwards? Um, I think British Rowing tried that over the last couple of years with Brendan. And I think Brendan did a good job. He came into a, a tough role. Um, almost trying to, like we say, change the whole ethos of where, what British Rome was built upon. Um, but his focus was more put on the athlete rather than the end performance. Um, and I think quite a lot of the athletes did progress very well through that way of thinking. It's just a shame it didn't happen on the day at the Olympics. But I think if we can take what Brendan was trying to put in with the athlete focus and what Jürgen was doing was very much driven trying to get, get that end process and find a nice sort of in-between I think we're definitely going to move in that right way. And I think since Louise was sort of brought on as the new PD, 
I think she has seen those sides. She's seen what worked with Brendan and what didn't work. She's seen what worked with Jürgen and what didn't work. She's been around a long time for that experience. And hopefully she will now be the bridge that we need moving forward to uh, Paris because the squad is strong. It just needs, you know, the rough edges just shaving off. <laughs> and uh, I suppose this is a, a, a good chance of um, jumping down my list of questions, but it fits in nicely. Um, are you staying on to Paris? Uh, still undecided. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. I think for me, the last couple of years have been challenging. Um, I think the, the last Olympic cycle, um, it didn't end how I wanted it to end. I think it started really well with winning everything and being one of the top guys. And I sort of went from three years of winning most things, being in the top boat every year, so then I actually had an, an injury in a blood clot in my leg um, off the back of a January training camp. And I couldn't train in a boat for three months trying to rehab myself back up. Um, and so that put me in a position where I had to race the Olympic, fight, the Olympic trials with the blood clot still in my leg, which technically should have been a medical exemption. Um, but we had, to, we had to put up with it. So I was in the boat with a blood clot. Will Satch was in the boat fresh off a back injury. Neither of us had been rowing for three months. <laughs> so we took it day by day just to see what we could do. And unfortunately, that was the result that determined both of our futures. Um, and then obviously we had lockdown. We didn't know what we were doing. So I spent pretty much sat where I am right now. I had a rowing machine set up across here and I was just rowing by myself for three to four months every day, just ticking off that mileage. Um, and then, yeah, just grinded away last year made the Olympic team, which probably didn't look possible based off the Olympic trial. Um, but ultimately, you know, you've committed 16 years to trying to get an Olympic medal and to not be given that chance was a bittersweet moment. Um, you know, I'm young enough and fit enough to carry on if I wanted to, to Paris. Um, but I'm sort of at that time now where I'm sort of trying to decide. And I think that will become more apparent as we move into the new year. You've obviously done a lot of racing for, for GB. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was your favourite race? My favourite race, I, I used to say it was either my first junior medal or my gold under 23s. But I think the one that stands out to me the most is my first senior gold medal in 2013 in the men's eight. And that was a good race in Amsterdam. And... It was a weird one because our top boat then was obviously the men's four and they were winning everything. Um, and then we had our men's eight, which was sort of like the second or third boat because the pair at the time, I think, were Matt Language and James Fode. And they were doing really well, winning medals everywhere. And we were always in the mix. We were always in the top three as British eights usually are, sort of always in and around the podium. Um, but we just had a lot of power. We just had to put it together, um, especially in the training we'd done leading up to that race. Portugal, Silveretta, we were doing very good times. Just in the moment, we just didn't perform when we needed to. And then we, we had to go through the rep that year because we didn't do well enough in the heat. So we had to go through to the rep. And the rep was the best thing for us because it just got, it got rid of the nerves. It got rid of everything. It's just like, right, focus, do one good race. Okay, we did that. We've qualified for the final. We're in a decent lane. Now just put the entire year. <laughs> we know we can do it. Just do it. Don't overthink it. When the green light goes, just go head down. You know, listen to feeling. Don't look at anything else. Just go as hard as you can and just see where you end up. And we came through 500 ahead. We came through 1,000 ahead. We came through 1,500 further ahead. You know, the field was coming back at us by the finish. And I think if it was another 100 metres further, the Germans would have had us. Um, but they didn't. It's only 2,000 metres. And for me, as a young gun, second year in the team, winning in the men's eight, I mean, that was the first time Mirish and men's eight had ever won gold was the year before that in Korea. So to do it two, two consecutive years in a row. And for me at the time, I think I was 24. So for me, that was great. Um, and so that would stick with me, definitely. Being an underdog and coming through to take the gold. That's just a, must have just been an incredible feeling. 
Um, mm. How long did that the the buzz last? It must have lasted months on, off something like that. <laughs> well, for me, I think it lasted about a week because I signed up to do what was the Hansa Cup and it's now the Nets Cup. So you go out, you celebrate that night with everyone, and then you go home and you sort of you have a couple of days by yourself trying to think things through. And then you're back to Cavisham training for this horrible race in Germany, which is effectively a 500 meter max effort ergo test on a concert stage in front of a, a crowd of people. And then the next day is a 250 meter sprint regatta knockout. And then the last day, I think is uh, I think it's about a 12,000 meter side by side race off a standing start. <laughs> and usually That's it's horrendous. the CB men's eight, the Polish men's eight, the German men's eight. I've raced the Australian men's eight there. And obviously the German men's eight are always there as well. So there's always a good mix of like national level eights and you just slog away for 12,000 meters. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as you get lined up for that, you forget about everything else. There's a new, there's a new target to go for. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can imagine. Um, <laughs> that just sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it for a little while for that reason alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Talking about your, your past success, uh, in 2017, uh, you won the, the stewards uh, at Henley yeah. Royal Regatta. And in that race, you, it was, of course, in a Coxless Four, you were sat with Mosa Behe uh, behind you. Um, yeah. What's it like to have uh, just a, a six foot nine monster rowing behind you? <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's a big guy, and he, 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 looking at him, he's a monster, but deep down, he's a big softie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. I mean, that, that again, was quite a turbulent season. Um, obviously, I, yeah, I, I won trials that year with Stuart, and Mo and Will, um, they, I think they had to pull out due, due to an injury, um, so they didn't get to completely perform at their best. No. Sorry, that was, that was 2018. 2017, Will and Mo won. And then me and Stuart came third behind Matt Rossiter and Jacob Dawson, who came second. So again, that was quite a turbulent year, um, the start of it. But then we made the four, but Stuart had an injury. So then we had to put in Callum. And then we went to the first World Cup. And for some reason, it, it just, it took quite a long time to click. I mean, we won the first World Cup, which was great. But in our opening race, um, we were like four lengths clear water down on the first place. And then somehow managed to row through them in the last 500 to win our heat. We went through to the final, had a better race, won gold. We then changed the seating order around again. We went to the European Championships. At that time, Mo was stroking it. Callum, was it? Three, Will was at two and I was at bow. Um, and in training, it was going okay. But we had a really bad result there. I think we ended up in the B final. I think maybe came ninth or tenth overall. Then we went back. We went to the drawing board again, switched everything up again, um, put Matt Roster into the boat, put him into the bow seat. And then our first race together um, was the following, I think was, I feel like it was Poznan where we came second to the Australians. But again, we had a really bad start that race. And the Australians had, I don't know, like a, looking at it from the TV, it was like five or six seconds on us by halfway. We managed to again claw it back to like a foot and got, get silver behind the Australians. Um, <laughs> yeah, so long story short, it was a quite a turbulent year, but had lots of ups and downs. And I think before that race in... Um, Henley, we just we just had to go back to the drawing boards and take a lot of confidence in what we what we were doing. And then we came together really well for that regatta, and we learned a lot from it. And um, the one memory from rowing with Mo in that boat wasn't actually the Henley experience; it was the Lucerne regatta that followed it, um, where we took everything we had learned from Henley and we put it together on on an international race. And we dominated every race we went out to dominate. And then in the final, we were sort of a couple of lengths clear of the field. Coming into maybe the last 250 metres, out of nowhere, Mo just screams. Just I can't even remember what he's like, go now. Just screamed. I completely jumped out of my seat, almost lost my rhythm with Will. 
we sort of crossed the line. It was fine. And then Mo's just like laughing. And he just wanted to see how we react out of nowhere. Like, you're winning the you're winning the World Cup. You're ahead. You want to stay loose and relaxed to make sure you don't muck up. And then out of nowhere, he just screams at you. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to see how we'd react in the moment. He's like, oh, yeah, just just wanted to see how it would go. And I was like, oh, cheers, mate. Like, next time, <laughs> bit of a heads up. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So- a lot of stuff like that used to happen quite a lot. And just little things on the start line. We just sort of have random jokes with each other. Just sort of because rowing can get quite stressful. And I think the more relaxed you can be, the better the result will be. So in that four, I think we had a quite good, um, relaxed approach to when it actually came to racing or just sort of having a bit more fun with it rather than having to do well. Yeah, that sounds like a really nice attitude and definitely something I think a lot of people could could learn a lot from. And I, I, I imagine uh, you're going to be rowing a lot better when you're, enjoying it when yeah. you're happy and having fun definitely um so uh following on from that uh your your favorite henley race mm-hmm. i would probably say it was my my first henley win in the pa um with brooks in my freshers year um so that would have been 2009 i believe uh, 2009 PA, I think, yeah, yep. we had, we raced, um, we had Yale in the final. Um, but again, that was a very good COPS 4 that we put together. I think the, the previous year, Brooks lost to Yui um, in the Temple. Or, and um, I was fresh into it and, you know, Brooks wanted to come back and prove themselves. And at that time, it was a very small club. We had one men's eight, we had our four. And I think we had like three women um so it was tiny compared to the size of brooks now um but i i I think that was probably my favorite race just coming in every single race and dominating it effectively i think we won all all our races by an easily verdict um and it was my first taste of sort of winning by that sort of margin so it always stuck with me and then obviously being part of a boat club like brooks you come off and everyone's there in their blazers and you know when you win at henley it's just it's it's not so much about you. It's about the club and everyone involved in the club. So it's a, a big celebration. It's, it's a lot of fun to win that one. That sounds amazing. Um, it's definitely something on the list of things I want to do is uh, <laughs> win a red box, but I've got, got a little way to go yet. Yeah. Don't enter the stewards then. <laughs> uh, no, it's not the stewards, the goblets, because you don't get a red box. You get a goblet. Oh, yeah, you get the... <laughs> Um, that's something else uh, that's on my list to ask to talk about. You beat uh, Vesta, Harry Bond, and Simon in mm-hmm. uh, in the semi-finals of the of the goblets uh, yeah. this year. Um, mm-hmm. Is that a tough race for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it wasn't a tough race, but it was a nice race. We um, before each race, we'd sort of see the opposition and I think Henley's a lot more intimate with that so you sort of sat behind the start line and we we had a good chat with them and just threw some banter about um so before we even got on the start line it was quite a nice fun environment and then you know gave them a little cheer once we crossed the line and we met up in the car park afterwards and shook hands and said thanks and a nice little chat so it's always nice that's the sort of side of Henley that I really enjoy as well oh that's that's uh something I've really enjoyed about Henley this year is you meet your opponents and uh, we're all just rows together at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm just like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, moving on. Well, I've already asked about Paris, but have you got any other personal challenges or personal goals come- going forward? Um, no real personal goals. I mean, that side of things, I'm quite boring. Um, I think mainly it's just trying to get, because obviously you commit so much time to rowing. Um, now that I'm away from Cavisham for a little while, it frees up a lot more time where I can focus on other bits and pieces. Um, you know, you put a lot of things on hold when you're sort of chasing that dream and everything revolves around that. So it's quite nice now just having that bit of time to, you know, reconnect with family and friends and go out and have a party every now and then and not worry about having to be in bed by 10 o'clock because you've got to be up at six o'clock the next morning for rowing you know just enjoy a bit more freedom um and you know 
like like you mentioned stuff on the side like just trying to build row elite and things like that sort of put some effort back into that because i let a lot of cobwebs start growing on that because i hadn't put much time and effort into it over the last year so that's nice being given the time to sort of relearn things and make things better so just uh, just for for my my viewers uh, do you want to talk a bit about row elite and uh, yeah, sure. project you've got going on there yeah so I mean I started row elite following the Rio Olympic Games and the main reason for it was just again I was a spare in Rio but I committed four years of just training as hard as possible and I needed something on the side that took the focus away from me but I mean obviously rowing row, row elite is still rowing related it, it, it's nice for me to put my focus onto someone else rather than always having it on myself and analyzing myself and how I'm performing and just put that into someone else. Um, so it sounds a bit weird, but it, it sort of, it helps me take the focus away from myself while still staying relevant to the sport. Um, and the initial idea was just a nice, simple online platform where people could submit video footage and I would analyze their technique and give them some coaching advice in return. Um, that never really took off the way I wanted it to, but instead people wanted more um, training programs and online coaching. So that was the route I ended up taking. Um, so now it's sort of five, six years old and it's been growing steadily over the years, which has been nice. And um, the main purpose of it now is um, we, I write training programs, just tailored rowing programs and weight programs for people like you and I, or CrossFitters, club goers, whatever goal whatever target however much time commitment they have there's always a way of trying to help you achieve the goals that you have um so i sort of try and take on all my experiences and from lucky enough you know from where i started at weybridge going through walton to brooks into the gb system i feel like i've been part of some of the, the best rowing programs in the world and i've learned a lot of what to do and what not to do and i sort of put that as much of that experience into the programs i write for my clients as possible um and it's nice. It creates a nice little community as well. We have an indoor rowing team. Um, and we have sort of about 85 members on that now. So today I'm still trying to plan our Christmas social. So I'm just trying to create that nice social aspect as if it was a rowing team. Because um, there are a lot of people that like indoor rowing that have never been on the water. But indoor rowing can be quite um, a lonely experience, I guess, because you need a rowing machine and just clock the miles. So if you've made a friend through Row Elite that you chat to on Facebook or WhatsApp, I quite enjoy trying to create situations where those two can meet and actually see each other in person. Um, I think it creates a much tighter friendship bond. Um, so I think that's it in its nutshell, training programs and community. <laughs> and I'll be putting the, the link to Roll Elite down in the description below. Um, so if, if you are interested, uh, make sure you can check out that website. Um, and I'm sure, sure Matt is all too keen to to be supporting more more people definitely yeah always um so as speaking from a more coaching perspective now uh i know there's there's lots of uh young athletes watch this channel lots of school school age rowers um and uh university age rowers as well um do you have any advice for them uh how can they be the best athlete they can? I think the main thing is just to try and enjoy the process. I think especially if, if, if you're a youngster in the sport, I know the reason I stayed with the sport is through the friendships that I made when I was younger at rowing at Walton and Weybridge. I came back every day and trained as hard as I could because I enjoyed being around the people that were at the club. So I think enjoying the process and making those friendships because Ultimately, if you want to get to the level where you're, you're trying to represent your country at the World Championships or the Olympics, it does become your life. So it's nice having those people stay in your life for as long as possible. For me personally, it's been hard trying to keep in contact with all my school friends and university friends because they weren't in the rowing world. But those who have rowed with me, you sort of create that special bond because you know you go through the hard mileage together. You go through those two ergos. There's like there's a weird connection where you know, you've been through the darkness together, so you know what it's like. So it's a lot easier to stay friends in that sort of circle. Um, so that'd be the main thing is just try and enjoy the process. And especially when you're young, just trying to learn as much as you can from the people around you and especially the coaching staff. 
you know, a lot of coaches are there because they have your best interests at heart and they want to help you push as hard as you can. And sometimes you're not going to necessarily agree with what they say, but ultimately you will learn that they have acted in your best interests. Um, and I think it's just being disciplined is the main thing. Um, it's very easy sometimes to lose, to lose track of that. And sometimes you have to take ownership of your own discipline. If a coach is constantly trying to get more out of you sooner or later, you have to understand why he's trying to do that. Like, how are you turning up to training? How are your mannerisms? Are you a bit gloomy? Are you a bit down all the time? Are you not quite interested? Are you turning up to sessions late? Um, you know, are you bringing the right kit to a training session? If you look out your window and it's raining, why would you turn up in just a Lycra? You know, just, it's just trying to lift the whole sort of, um, the benefits of the training, just make sure that you're prepared and you're thinking ahead and you have the discipline. And I think that definitely translates through to more of the student rowers when you're at university, you know, it's very easy to go out as often as you can and drink and have fun with your friends. And, you know, you've just left home with your parents. So you're not quite sure what you're doing. You know, you're, you're learning to use a, a washing machine for the first time and stuff like that. And just, you know, just make sure you're ticking the boxes. If you're serious about it, you have to put in the work and the time. I mean, there's always going to be areas, especially when you're at uni, you have fun, but sort of know your limits. And I think that's what I had to really focus on after my first year, which is, you know, I, I want to pursue this as a career. So I need to start making sure I'm doing everything I can um, to try and make that as achievable as possible. And as soon as I made that switch, I was still having fun. I was still enjoying it. I was still going out with my friends. But I knew there was a point where, you know, I can't go past that because it would start hindering my ultimate goal, which is to make the senior team and, you know, one day go to the Olympics. Um, so, I mean, have fun, be disciplined and just enjoy the process, really. You know, you've got to work hard. I think that's absolutely brilliant advice. And uh, it's really something that that anyone watching can actively do. And you can make that change just immediately is just uh, to change your focus and, uh, be more be more on it really um mm. and uh, something that was said to me in my first year of rowing um friends who work together stay together <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so i'm going to move us on to the to the quick fire round of of the interview um but if there is something you want to dwell on do do free feel free to to dwell um okay <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, what's the erg that you dread? The five k. The five k. Not a. Not a. Yeah. You're a. You take a two k over a five k. Yeah, two k is over right quicker. The faster <laughs> it's over, the better. <laughs> um, your favourite post session snack? Um, I think post session it would usually be sort of my second breakfast at Cavisham. And uh, Martin, the chef there, does a really good, it's called Bircher, Bircher Muesli, but it's basically overnight oats, but it's mixed with lots of dried fruit and orange, orange zest. And you have it with nice Greek yogurt and some berries on top. So I think coming in from a hard, long first session, having that before your second session, so for me, ticks all the boxes. <laughs> that sounds lovely. That's mm. a bit, bit of a difference from your, from your tube of Weetabix as well. That did pop into my head, but I thought, <laughs> away from that and actually talk about something that i've had more recently <laughs> <laughs> um coxed or coxless um i think as much as i love henry i'd probably have to go coxless a bit faster over quicker again yeah I, plus i'm in control of more things <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> um sculling or sweep uh sweep because i suck at sculling um don't we all <laughs> empacker or felipe uh empacker uh fast erg and poor technique or or slow erg and amazing technique uh, i would probably i would probably go for technique over pure ergo performance i think there's a lot of big guys who um can't necessarily move boats very well but at the same time there's a lot of i guess smaller guys who can move boats very well and i think talking back to coaches previously it's good to find someone 
who's a good balance rather than just relying all on one or the other. Because ultimately, the only results that matter are the ones you get on the water. So if you're faster on the water, I think that's the route we should be going. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what's the call that gets you the most fired up? Uh, <laughs> Well, there's one that Henry says, but I can't remember the words and I won't do it justice. Um, but it's one that he says in the A and he reels it off every time. And that always gets the blood pumping. Um, <laughs> the other ones are probably too rude to say <laughs> like on YouTube. Um, but no, apart, like the funny things is that when we had feeling and um, when Jürgen was around, it was always just be outside of just the usual banter, like lads boat stuff that can't be aired it's more <laughs> just like you know trust the training trust the legs you know you're built for this effectively how much can you bicep curl <laughs> well i was bicep curling 40 yesterday um for just i was just for the photo shoot so i had to look big for it um <laughs> but i think currently <laughs> If I'm getting specific about my training, I'm going for a hypertrophy phase. So I'm not going so heavy, but I sort of 20 kilos um, gets a good pump on when you're doing sort of six to eight sets of 20. Is that, is that each arm or bar, barbell? No, that's just, a, that's just a 20 kilo barbell. Okay. So I mean, it's really that's... nice and quick and easy for sort of 10 to 15. And then the last sort of five starts hurting. But once you only have sort of a, a minute's rest and then you do it again it's a bit like the brooks weights old brooks weights used to do 660s but we'd use 40 kilo bars for everything and the first set was fine but by the end you couldn't walk so <laughs> what's your favorite domestic race um domestic so I'd, I'd probably say Henley's domestic. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I mean, we don't get to do that much racing um, outside of uh, outside of the British team. We can do Force Head, we can do Ace Head and Henley. Those are sort of the only three we get to do. Um, but I actually, if it wasn't going to be Henley, I'd probably say Peterborough. I mean, it's quite tame now one. compared to what it used to be. But Peterborough Regatta back in the day used to get quite loose. <laughs> <laughs> knows about it will probably know i think it's quite tame now but peterborough was always a good regatta um what's your pre 2k food um so i would have my last big meal three hours beforehand um purely to digest and actually start using it a lot of people especially the youngsters are probably down a pint like a bowl of pasta an hour before and then projectile vomit it afterwards it's not the best advice so or shop if you're going to have a meal like that, have it three hours before. So it's not sitting heavy in your stomach. Um, that would usually just be anything and everything that I fancy. Uh, you know, most things break down and use them as energy anyway. Um, but then an hour from the race is when I'd have my last meal. And it's not really a meal. It would just be a snack. So from three hours to an hour before I'd just be snacking. So my, my real pre 2k snack would probably be, you know, Usually it's a bagel with some jam on it. So you've got a good mix of quick and slow release carbohydrates, but it's not going to sit heavy in your stomach. So, you know, you want as little in you as possible because then you've got a less chance of it coming out at the end. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lesson a lot of people have learned the hard way, I think. <laughs> um, pasta or potatoes? Um, if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said potatoes. Um, but currently I'm, I'm enjoying pasta again. So I'm nailing a lot of pasta at the moment. Um, uh, I think you've, you've answered this, you've mentioned this a few times, but uh, the club that you learned to row at? Well, the original club was Weybridge. Uh, I was there for two years and then I went to Walton for about uh, a year and a half, I guess. So you, you weren't a, a schoolboy rower? No, no, club boy through and through. Um, Weybridge was sort of led by the parents. And then um, a chap called Paul Wilcox, who coached at St. George's, was our first paid coach at Weybridge. He saw that I was quite talented on the ergo, so he signed me up to trials. And as soon as I got accepted, he told me to move up the river to Walton. Um, so I did that, got coached by Nick DeCarta, um, went to, to Junior Worlds and then progressed on to Brooks. And 
Finally, uh, do you have a pre-race ritual? Any superstitions? Superstitions? Uh, no, not really. I just try and stay as relaxed as possible. I think the only ritual most rowers stick to is your warm-up ritual. And I think I found one that works best for me. So I'm quite meticulous with how I do that and how much time I need to do that and go through it step by step to make sure that I feel I'm ready to do a 2K. Outside of that, I actually try and keep my music quite calm. And then when it comes to doing a 2K, I have no music at all. I just like to focus in and be on the zone. So I don't have music for ergo tests. I just use it beforehand to, I guess, regulate the nerves. So I don't want to be G'd up for the hours leading into it. I want to be as calm as possible. So that once once it goes, I can put all that focus and that aggression into that one piece. No music at all. Not for the test ergos, only for the warm up leading into it. And do you like being shouted at, or are you just in complete silence? Uh, it I think it depends. It depends if I'm doing well or not. If I'm not doing very well, and someone's telling me to keep pushing, I don't want them to be talking to me at all. I'm like, just <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> I'm in a hole. I'm doing really badly. Just leave me alone. If I'm doing better than expected, yeah, sure, come in. I'll make it look like I'm doing this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much again for your time. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, the, the the link to Row Elite is in the description down below. Uh, any any final thoughts, Matt, or anything you want to mention again? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think you know we're going through turbulent times. Um, you know, just always stay true to that goal. I mean, if most people, their goal is Henley, you know, we found out this year that Henley can be held. Um, there's no reason why it can't be held next year. We don't know what's going on at the moment, but ultimately what Jürgen would say is losers train harder. So if you didn't get what you wanted to do this year, then make sure you're doing enough to make sure you do achieve it next year. If you did achieve what you want this year, don't get complacent because those losers are going to be training harder to catch you. So don't let complacency take over the level you're at, at the moment. You need to keep that being pushed forwards. Um, you know, to keep working hard and don't get complacent. <laughs> Very wise words. Um, thank you so much for your time uh, and for your brilliant answers. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Um, and good luck with whatever you decide to do for the next Olympiad. Thank you very much. <laughs>